Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's great to have Dr. Aralis here with us today. She's actively involved in a lot of research projects. I know connected with up on campus and psychiatry, some really good health disparities research, and also with the Department of Biostatistics. And related to HIV today, she's going to talk to us about multi-state modeling. I think, yes, multi-state modeling around uh, men having sex with men. So thanks for a lot for being here. Yeah, as uh, Scott mentioned, I'm um, a tech assistant professor here in the Department of Biostatistics. I actually also did my um, doctorate here, finishing up uh, a year and a half ago. And so actually what I'm talking about today um, is kind of some of the earlier research I did during my dissertation that got me really interested in multi-state models. Um, and it applies to the modeling of um, sexual partnership patterns, specifically using retrospective sexual history data collected from uh, men having sex with men right here in Los Angeles. Um, I'm not positive of everyone's backgrounds in this room, so definitely feel free to interrupt me if you have questions or let me know if you think I'm going too slow or boring. <laughs> Um, okay, and a lot of this is also done, I'll get um, more thanks at the end, but along in um, collaboration with Dr. Brookmeyer here, who was my assistant, who continues to be my collaborator here. Um, so, <clears throat> so you probably are aware of what concurrency is. So concurrency is defined as overlapping dates of sexual partnership. Um, and whereas there are a number of sexual partnership dynamics that um, we're all probably aware have been known to impact HIV transmission, such as um, the number and duration of partners, the frequency and type of sexual intercourse, the um, phase between partnerships, the gaps between partnerships. Um, but there's still kind of this outstanding question of whether or not concurrency in and of itself, um, kind of holding all other things constant, um, can be attributed to HIV transmission within a community or increased levels of HIV transmission at kind of a community or population level. Um, so just to kind of give just a very basic demonstration of concurrency, um, if you imagine somebody coming into, a patient coming into a clinic um, and reporting the number of days before their visit that um, their partnerships, the, you know, say last three most recent partnerships started and ended, um, concurrency is often defined as kind of a negative gap if you um, subtract the end date of the um, you know, third most recent partner here from the start date of the second most recent partner. This would be an example of a concurrent partnership. Um, this here where there's a non-negative gap between partnerships is an example of what we'll refer to as serial monogamy. Um, so when I'm saying holding all of other things fixed, um, we're talking about whether or not, say, within the last year, if somebody reports three partnerships, each lasting two months, um, does it you know, increase risk of HIV transmission if those three partnerships overlapped relative to being kind of separate? So we're holding things like the number of partnerships and the duration of the partnerships fixed. Um, and so in theory, as you can imagine, um, and has been demonstrated, concurrency does, um, in theory, increase risk of HIV the transmission within a population because it kind of it creates this bi-directional um, loop. Um, when there's a gap, the most recent partner cannot transmit HIV necessarily back um, to this partner, the first partner. But, um, but when there is this overlap, you end up getting it so that the subsequent partner can transmit to the previous partner. So there's um, there's, in theory, you can see how this works. However, um, strong empirical evidence has been really difficult to come by. Um, that has actually created a bit of um, kind of controversy in the literature, and with a variety of articles coming out saying that, um, especially related to um, Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a lot of articles coming out saying that have said that concurrent sexual partnerships have actually been a real determinant of the um, high rates of transmission in Sub-Saharan Africa. These studies claim that um, concurrency has been measured and is higher in Sub-Saharan Africa relative to other 
regions and that um, correspondingly the uh, rates of transmission are higher. Some of these studies, such as this one by Mon Halperin, has even said that that could the differing rates of concurrency could also contribute to the differing um, rates of transmission across um, ethnic and racial groups within the U.S. Um, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of people that are that have also responded saying that there's that the, the evidence is really flimsy and that these are kind of conclusions that haven't been haven't been shown. Um, <clears throat> And then there's a variety of mathematical models that have demonstrated, as I said, that it's, it's possible, but, but we're not sure. Um, and why is, one of the big reasons why it's been difficult to get to the bottom of this is that measurement, measuring concurrency is, has been challenging. Um, ideally, we would want to measure in a given population both the extent and the magnitude of concurrency. Um, but a lot of the approaches for collecting data related to concurrency um, have various flaws. So some surveys will ask participants to recall the number of partnerships that they had over some last period of time, for instance, three months. Um, and in any instance, when they report more than one partnership within three months, um, they're assuming that, that those partnerships are concurrent. Obviously, there's some flaws with that. Um, asking partnerships um, asking participants to actually identify themselves whether or not they had um, they experienced a concurrent partnership, uh, which maybe could give kind of a, an estimate um, of kind of the, the prevalence of concurrency, but it doesn't give us any information really about um, kind of the duration or the um, magnitude. So. Um, and then there's kind of one of the most common methods, which is asking participants to recall the start and end dates of all previous and ongoing relationships that occurred over some elapsed time interval in the previous year. And that will refer to as the method. And among these retrospective um, collection methods, this calendar method has a lot of strengths in that you're collecting um, kind of both parts of the information that you would want, the extent, um, kind of like how many people are affected by this, and then also the magnitude. So you know, how many concurrent relationships and um, for how long, but what are those overlaps essentially. So it would be ideal if we could follow people prospectively forward in time and just um, observe their um, concurrent relationships, but when we're looking for retrospective data, this is kind of the, um, the data that we often have to work with, the best data we have to work with. Um, so I want to define a few quantities that we would like to estimate related to concurrency, so we'll define the concurrent partnership distribution. Um, so we'll let pi k indicate the probability that an individual member of the population has k ongoing partnerships at any instant in time, um, where k can take values ranging um, to the non-negative integers. Uh, so that's kind of your point prevalence of concurrency um, at a given moment in time. And then there's the mean concurrent partnership sojourn time. Um, so for an individual in K ongoing partnerships, we let rho K indicate the mean duration of time until the next partnership formation or dissolution occurs. So if you are in a state of having two ongoing partnerships, two concurrent partnerships, um, on average, how long do you remain in that state prior to um, forming a new partnership or having one of those two dissolve? And again, we let K take values in the non-negative integers. So these quantities are important for a couple of reasons. If we can um, obtain empirical estimates of these two quantities, we can um, this would allow us to draw inferences about um, populations from which we collected data about their partnership patterns and potentially then to compare across populations. Um, in addition, being able to have good estimates of these quantities would allow us to um, obtain good input for maybe disease simulation models. You could um, simulate data, introduce um, you know, um, a new strain of disease, and see how it kind of plays out in a network of um, partnership patterns. All right, so. Some more about calendar method data and why um, 
you know, although it contains a lot of the information we need, why it hasn't necessarily helped us to date to answer the question about concurrency is, um, so calendar method, as I mentioned, you're asking each participant to recall start and end dates of all their previous and ongoing sexual partnerships. You might end up with data looking like this. So where we have, this is two individuals, um, and they've each reported on three of their previous relationships, um, the number of days ago that they started and ended. Um, when we plot this out, you can see that the individual number one, who is the blue lines here, um, reported one partnership that lasted 196 days and started um, 409 days ago and ended 213 days ago. Um, and then you can see reported another partnership here and then a third partnership that's still ongoing. Um, so when it comes time to analyze this type of data, um, one of the um, common issues is that people have tried to analyze it at kind of the partnership level. Um, so if you are interested in looking at um, the concurrent partnership distribution that I mentioned before, they might recommend taking kind of a point in time, say 60 days prior to the date of the, um, the cross-sectional survey that's been administered, and saying, you know, on average, um, how many partnerships does an individual have um, at that point in time? So if we were just looking at these two individuals, um, you'd say, you know, on average, 50% of subjects in your sample uh, were engaged in concurrent partnerships. Um, but obviously that kind of reduces down all the data that we actually have. Um, there's also been a lot of debate over what would be the appropriate point in time to take this kind of snapshot. Um, so there's been issues there, and then of course treating partnerships as um, looking at a partnership level of analysis if you are um, calculating kind of that um, sojourn time, mean sojourn time. Um, you know, if you are just taking all of the partnerships and treating them as if they're I and D, um, then you're going to get a mean duration of 100.5 days, and we know that there's some issues there that you're not really accounting for. Um, other things that are commonly overlooked with, part, with this type of data is issues of right censoring and length bias sampling. Um, again, when looking at kind of the partnerships as independent. Okay, so what motivated this particular um, this particular um, kind of methods work is um, actually a study called a NIDA funded study called Transmission Behavior and Partnerships of Newly HIV Infected Southern Californians. Um, it's commonly referred to as the Metromate study. And um, the PI is Dr. Pamina Gorbach, who some of you uh, may be familiar with. She's over in UCLA Epidemiology. Um, so she's responsible for this real effort in um, collecting the data and also um, kind of brought the, the big research question to our attention. Um, so the study consisted of recruiting um, a sample of men who have sex with men from the Los Angeles LGBT Center through their sexual health program. And the recruitment occurred between February 2009 and May 2012. Uh, criteria for inclusion in the study um, were male 18 years of age or older, um, having reported sex with a uh, man within the past 12 months, and then having received a new HIV test. So they were recruited, for, they recruited their sample from men who came in for HIV testing. They were not aware when they came in of their status. Um, they intentionally oversampled HIV-infected individuals. Um, so the, ultimately, the sample we're looking at today had 196 um, HIV-infected HIV men and 99 um, HIV-negative. Um, and as we just discussed, they asked. What do you mean they oversampled? They didn't take all people. So. Um, no. I think the way the study was rolled out, they were initially, to my understanding, they were initially trying to sample individuals who were, who had been recently affected, recently HIV infected, um, and to determine that using, I think, biomarkers. They were really interested in recent infection. Um, because of recruitment challenges, I think they eventually opened it up to include 
um, some HIV uninfected individuals and HIV infected, chronically infected, so people who weren't aware of their HIV status, but were, um, but had been, their infection had occurred perhaps um, farther back. So there's some, some issues too that just to keep in mind too about how representative the sample may or may not be. Yeah, no, um, I know what you mean. Um, yeah, I think that from the people who came in and got tested, I think they um, then approached them asking if they wanted to participate in the study. The actual study involved a follow up as well, so it involved kind of a baseline assessment of things in their follow up. But I could verify this in a little while. Um, so within this, oh yeah. So, sorry, I just. Uh, well, my, I have a question regarding the gap calendar method. Yeah. So I'm curious in the real survey that the participant yeah. receives, what do they actually see? Do they have to list, let's say, one person has 100 sexual partners in the, in the past year, which is a likely number yeah. of gay men, then do they list all of those 100 person yeah. and, and try to choose start and end date for each of them? <laughs> Yeah, um, no. So that's one of the <laughs> <laughs> that's actually one of the big limitations in what I'm presenting here as well is that you know, as you're it sounds like aware, data collection systems don't well probably participants don't have time, but also data collection systems a lot of times aren't flexible enough um, to accommodate just kind of an you know, endless number of entries. And so this particular system was capped at six. Uh, and I actually think up to I think twenty percent of this sample that we're going to be talking about today entered six partnerships. So who knows if there had been ninety, maybe they would have entered ninety. You know, so that in general is probably biasing some of our results. You know, in the direction that we're we're witnessing, we're seeing less partnerships. Um, and yeah, how far back were they? A year. So partnerships that um, that took place um, anytime within the year. So that's kind of one of the um, one of the kind of issues too. Also, in these are common issues to just calendar method and data collection. And so I think in diving into analyzing this data, we you know we, we tackle kind of a big aspect of it, but there's so many complexity and so many challenges um, that, that go along with this. So one of them being that, as is typical, they were, um, respondents were allowed to choose what unit of um, time they wanted to use when reporting start and end dates for um, relationships or for partnerships. And so they could choose whether or not it was um, days, weeks, or months. Um, how many months ago did your partnership start or stop? So we used kind of a um, crude you know, month translates to 30 days, week translates to seven days, but there are kind of issues in here. Um, mainly, you know, if you said someone reported that a partnership um, stopped, uh, started two months ago and ended one month ago, and reported that another partnership started one month ago, you kind of wonder are those partnerships really overlapping? Um, are they not? Uh, was there concurrency? Because it's just kind of the imprecision with which they're reporting. Um, so kind of as you brought up as well, um, you know, among this particular population of MSM in Los Angeles, um, it's, it's not comparable to some of the other samples necessarily that have looked at trying to model concurrent partnerships. Um, one of the kind of anomalies is that um, almost 60% of the partnerships reported among our 295 respondents um, were actually duration less than a day. So it started, you know, five days ago, we did five days ago. Um, and so we, for the sake of this analysis, are referring to these, as is done in the literature sometimes, as one-offs. Mm -hmm. um, and actually it represented 74% of all the respondents in our sample reported at least one. And so while um, in modeling kind of these um, partnership patterns for the sake of HIV transmission, um, any individual one-off isn't necessarily hypothesized to carry with it a big impact on HIV 
transmission in and of itself. When you think about the extent and the number, um, it's important to think about including them in any sort of model that's going to be kind of trying to accurately capture what these partnership patterns are. Um, also, one-offs, we hypothesized that one-offs could have, um, in and of themselves, could have an impact on subsequent um, partnership um, formation or dissolution. So being able to predict how those events um, work alongside the kind of trajectory of um, partnership patterns for ongoing partnerships was important to us as well. Okay, so this kind of brings me to our objectives and trying to build a reasonable model for um, partnership, um, sexual partnership patterns in this um, particular population. We wanted to develop a model that, um, uh, that allows for the dependence among partnerships engaged in by the same person at the same time or at different times. Um, so not treating partnerships as if they're independent events. Um, and then we wanted a model that could be used to, in a straightforward way to estimate both our measures of extent and magnitude, so our concurrent partnership distribution and our mean concurrent partnerships at different times. Also on a model that's flexible enough to incorporate explanatory covariates um, and to also, as I just mentioned, um, allow for the occurrence of one-offs to, to be both modeled but also to impact um, ongoing partnership formation and dissolution. So um, the model that we're proposing is a joint model. Um, it kind of comes in two parts. The main, the first model I'm going to talk, the first component of the joint model that I'm going to talk about is the multi-state model. So you're probably, most of you are probably familiar with multi-state models, but um, there are models for continuous time stochastic processes um, that can occupy one of any number of discrete states at every instant in time. So changing of states is referred to as a transition. Um, states have properties where they can be transient, meaning they can be entered into and exited out of, or absorbing, meaning they can only be entered into and never exited out of. Um, Multi-state models are usually fit to longitudinal observations of a categorical variable. Um, some um, examples that you'll commonly see are where states correspond to um, levels of clinical symptoms, biological markers, stages of disease, um, and they're common in HIV, dementia, um, health services research, kind of mental health trajectories, cancer remission. Um, they're being used, I think, more and more. Uh, so how are we going to use a multi-state model? Um, we will use a multi-state model here to model individual's trajectory through um, different numbers of ongoing partnerships. So here we're going to define a state um, as the number of ongoing partnerships an individual is in at a given point in time. Um, and this allows us to model each individual's um, trajectory as its own stochastic process. Um, so this kind of accomplishes our first modeling its objective of, um, of uh, accounting for that dependence within individual at the same or different points in time, and like linking those partnerships together. So here's an example from some calendar data where an individual um, reported kind of start and end dates of three partnerships and how you would translate it into um, into multi-state data. So this individual started the 365 day interval in the state of no ongoing partnerships, they formed a partnership um, here around day 300, and then um, subsequently they formed a second partnership and had two ongoing partnerships for a while, um, two ongoing partnerships for a while, formed a third partnership and had three, back down to two, and back down to one as the um, partner partnership dissolution occurred. Uh, so they end the year interval um, being centered in a state of one partnership. Okay. So um, the second component, um, because that first component really does address our first modeling objective about the dependence, but it and it also would allow us to incorporate explanatory variables, but we really need some to add to the model in order to um, account for one-offs. Um, so we choose to model the occurrence of one-offs using a Poisson point process, um, 
plus state specific rates. And that's referred to as a Markov modulated Poisson process, um, meaning that the rates of one offs um, are, are dependent on what an underlying state that um, the process is in. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, we're going to choose the state based on the state that we just described, the state being the number of ongoing partnerships. Um, so here we've kind of combined everything into one. Um, so here I'm, I'm talking about state. I'm using the term state to refer to number of ongoing partnerships. So the multi-state model we just um, discussed. I'm going to use the term status, um, which is kind of an arbitrary term, but to refer to the number of one-offs that have occurred um, within a sense entry into the current state. So um, here, the, for instance, here at the start, the state is one and the status is zero. Once this pink dot occurs, we're still in state one, but your status now is one because one one-off has occurred um, since entry into the state. And so, um, so we're basically modeling this joint model that models both state and status. So it models both the number of ongoing partnerships an individual is in at a given point in time and the number of one-offs that have occurred since entry into that um, state. Um, so this um, <clears throat> this actually creates um, a bivariate time homogeneous continuous time Markov chain, but we can use essentially this um, bivariate um, variable z of t, which consists of y t and n t. We let y t denote the number of ongoing partnerships at time t, um, so it can take values ranging from integer values ranging from zero to um, S, if you assume there's kind of the maximum number. Um, in this study, we would assume we have equal six, I guess, because that's the most possible partnership that any one person could report having at any one point in time. Um, and so then transitions in YT, our multi-state process, represent partnership formations and dissolutions. Then we have NT, um, which is a counting process that counts the number of one-offs having occurred since the last transition in Y. Um, so at any given instant T, an individual has values for YT and NT corresponding to number of partnerships, number of one-offs um, since entering into that state. Okay. Um, so in order to incorporate explanatory variables, we do so in the hazard rates. Um, and so I've represented those using alpha. Um, alpha 1 is our hazard, um, our formation hazard rate. So this is the hazard for formation of a new partnership. Um, we're simply expressing it log linearly, where it's a function related to, that depends on nt. So our number of one-offs since entering into, um, into the current state. And xt, which is a potential vector of um, explanatory variables. Um, so we chose to have separate hazard functions for formation, which is indexed with a 1, dissolution, which is indexed with a 2, and then actually a, a third um, hazard function that's indexed with a 0 that indicates formation of a, um, formation of uh, going from 0 to 1 partnership because um, we kind of hypothesized that that was slightly, a slightly different um, hazard perhaps than gaining a concurrent partnership, which is really what this formation hazard is. Um, but the solutions are kept the same. And these are, you know, these are what we chose for this particular application, but you can kind of choose which hazards you feel like explicitly modeling, um, you know, kind of depending on what your own ideas for your sample would be. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we can then include kind of in our um, F in our X vector, we can include things like respondent age, HIV status, anything that we think might be influencing these hazards of transition, um, transition being, in this instance, um, the multi-state process transition, so formation or dissolution of an ongoing partnership. So those hazard rates, yeah. when they're formulated, they really don't depend on how many current partners have. Right, um, other than this one. 
And that's just a choice we made, kind of in trying to do the balancing of how many parameters we wanted, how many unique parameters we wanted to estimate. But it's interesting because the, the one offs aren't counted as partners in that sense. No. Right. Mm -hmm. So that the, 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 right. like you would think the, yeah. that might be a different, you know, there's a, a different process that, uh, a different psychology, if you will, for, for what uh, leads people to engage in one offs versus what leads people to engage in multiple partners. So, yeah, and I think, you know, we really sat down on wanting to do build just a multi-state model for the ongoing partnerships and thinking of one-off is just very short ongoing partnerships that um, when we kind of, um, you know, looked at the data with the 60% and yeah. spoke with just you people would, like Tamina, <laughs> yeah, we were, LGBT you know, and she was saying, well, maybe, you know, one-offs also can be different in a lot of ways when it comes to HIV transmission because Sometimes she was saying maybe they involve are more off, more likely to involve more risky behaviors, or um, in addition to drugs, you're less likely to use certain types of protection. And so she really also felt like um, treating the one off separately was, was kind of an important step for this sample. But you know, you could. The nice thing is that this model, this joint modeling idea, is as flexible in the, the way you go about. Um, you know, formulating it, you could you could imagine with a different population that had kind of different characteristics in terms of the patterns you're observing in the data, having a different kind of model formula would work. So, so your model does it include a model of the hazard of a one-off? Um, those are modeled simply as um, we'll get onto on the next slide, but as a Poisson process. And so um, there's a rate of one-offs that's specific to the state that you're in. Um, and those are so those are dependent just simply on the state. They're not, and because it's a Poisson process is what we've assumed, um, it's a constant rate um, within a given state. Um, so, so yeah, there's kind of other assumptions you can consider too. Uh, so yeah, this is how. This lambda t is actually how we've chosen to model the rate of one-offs. Um, and so there's essentially baseline um, rate here, and then we've well, linearly included um, a, the um, option to include explanatory variables. So our one-off rates depend on current number of ongoing partnerships, um, yt. Um, in addition to these explanatory variables. And so here's another kind of simplifying assumption we made um, is that we chose to estimate three levels of um, three different rates. Again, um, one rate for when you're in a state of no ongoing partnerships, a separate rate, separate baseline rate for when you're in a state of one ongoing partnership, so like an openness <coughs> partnership. And then a third rate for when you're in a state of concurrent partnership. But I think that's the same for all individuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some, yeah. I mean, we have to. Yeah. Some assumptions to estimate this, but it's, uh, I mean, that, that yeah. would be, uh, um, yeah. well, I guess there's different individuals who have different hexes, so in that sense, they would have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you could, yeah. yeah, definitely some of the heterogeneity across individuals you would want to model using kind of more covariates, because you could probably do a random effect. We have a little bit of um, So I'm not going to get into too much detail about kind of estimating the likelihood, because um, it's not nothing too complicated, but this is just kind of a demonstration of how you would go about breaking up an individual's trajectory into components that would go into calculation of um, that individual's contribution to the likelihood function. So this is an individual who um, had um, was in a state of one partnership, one ongoing partnership, then two, then three, then back to two, and they experienced a one-off. Um, 
somewhere right here along when they were in a state of two ongoing partnerships. So um, you kind of can break it up into each of these different kind of chunks based on each event that's occurring, be it a formation or dissolution or um, a one-off. Um, and then we're calculating kind of a survival function in addition to a um, hazard function for the actual event. Um, and you're at each kind of of these chunks in time, um, the covariate, the explanatory variables that you're incorporating into, um, that can be incorporated into the actual likelihood that X um, is going to be static with respect to the start of the, uh, the entry into the current state. So that's kind of as flexible as the time varying component can be. Okay, and so lastly, one of the objectives was to be able to estimate those, um, those quantities we were interested in, um, and to do that kind of simply from the model formulation, so the concurrent partnership distribution. Um, so we can actually estimate that um, by solving the equilibrium equation, so pi q equals zero, um, where q is kind of the infinitesimal um, generator matrix. Um, in order to do this, we kind of do some um, truncation, basically, um, at wherever you choose. We kind of need to choose, in order to make it tractable, um, kind of a maximum number of um, partnerships, ongoing partnerships and one-offs at which we're going to go out to. And so the farther out you go in, in solving this equilibrium equation, um, you know, the better accuracy you're going to get, but you know, that's can kind of just choose to go out as far as you'd like with that. Um, and that gives us a set of um, pi ki, um, and you can kind of sum across i, which is um, whatever you kind of truncated the number of possible one off that in order to get an estimator of pi k, which again is the probability of an instant in time for an individual in the population to be engaged in k ongoing partnerships. Um, and then to calculate the mean concurrent um, partnership sojourn time, we can use kind of this iterative expectation um, formula. Once again, it involves some um, truncation at a certain point, but you can kind of um, get kind of as, as close as you'd like in terms of accuracy by taking this out. Um, in order to do so, it involves defining the mean sojourn time in state K with S1 offs as mu KS. Um, and then delta ks as um, given that an event occurred, the probability that the event was a formation or dissolution for an individual in the state of k with s one off. So um, basically, um, kind of taking out the calculating kind of the mean sojourn time attributed to in the state k attributed to kind of the time on average somebody would spend. Um, the expected time to spend in a state K with zero one off is plus the expected time in state K with one one off plus two plus three, taking it out kind of as far as you um, as far as you can. So is it is the root of all the one offs themselves that are frequently triggers for dissolution or that sort of that? Yeah. So um, yeah. So these, are, this is, for instance, hazard of dissolution, and so that we do have this parameter, the number of one-offs that have occurred since. Um, okay. So it's the so beta one, and so, so. Right, exactly. So, so they can affect formation or dissolution via this kind of. Yeah. So kind of, there's some feedback in that the formation and dissolution are kind of, it can be influenced by the occurrence of one-offs through this formulation, and then we'll kind of more explicitly the rate of um, one-offs themselves are dependent on the state that you're in. So um, we kind of went through a, a process of looking at um, a few different covariates and ended up selecting and presenting the results from this model, which include, ended up including, we looked at the potential for covariates in both kind of components of the model. So um, you can obviously include them in the um, multi-state portion component of the model that models 
the ongoing partnership or in the, um, the Poisson rate, which is expressed as a function of, um, can be expressed as a function of explanatory variables as well. So the model that we're presenting results for here um, is a model that just includes count of one off um, in addition to HIV status, and HIV status is only included in the multi-state um, portion of the model, uh, not in the one-offs. And so um, some of the kind of the main results here are count of one-offs. You can see um, is actually for each additional one-off occurring. Um, you see an increased hazard, subsequent increased hazard of dissolution um, for ongoing partnerships. And that's um, increased by like 1.56 fold. So it did increase the risk for that. Um, and then when we kind of calculated using those formulas that I discussed previously, some of our metrics of interest, um, I decided to do it separately for HIV positive and HIV negative, because um, that kind of hypothesis was a bit of interest to us. Um, so you actually can see that for the HIV positive, um, for our, our HIV positive individuals, we're estimating that 18% of them at any given instant in time are in a state of two or more ongoing partnerships. So 18% engaging in concurrency at any instant in time relative to our estimated 10% of the population among our HIV negative. Um, and just as a reminder kind of about the, um, the sample, these are, this is behavior that they reported in the year prior to coming in, receiving testing, and being informed that they were HIV positive. So, um, so it's not necessarily reflective of the partnership patterns with somebody who's aware of their HIV status. Um, and then also you notice here that 74% of the HIV negative um, sample is a, a population was estimated at any given instance of being um, no ongoing partnerships relative to 63% among HIV positive individuals. You don't see too large of differences between when it comes to the mean concurrent partnership time but on average, people in a state of no ongoing partnerships remain there for um, a rather long time, for I mean, a year, over a year, a year and a half, um, relative to people who are in states of one or two or more partnerships remain in that state um, for closer to 120 days. You can kind of eyeball those differences, but did yeah. you also test between the yeah. and the positives? Yeah, um, I think we did. Um, sorry, there's no kind of confidence in anything on any of this, but we actually did a bootstrap, a parametric bootstrap, to obtain confidence intervals for these metrics. Um, and then I do believe we looked at kind of differences across them. Um, yeah, but I won't. Oh, that's fine. Sure. <laughs> And then interest did that, did that, that showed up as being significant. Not, I don't believe that different methods. What was your sample size? Um, 295. It was like 96 or 99. Uh, for the negatives that were 99 or positive. 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 Positive component of the model, the one-offs part of the model is in a state of HIV as a covariate, but you do see that the mean number of one-offs per year is highest for individuals in zero ongoing partnerships, followed by individuals in two or more ongoing partnerships, um, and lowest for individuals in one ongoing partnership, which may be um, and we chose to collapse this into greater than or equal to two for the sake of presentation, basically. But, um, calculated for any given number of um, ongoing partnerships. Okay, and so one of the things, this is, oh, sorry. I have a question from the last slide. Did you test that there was a difference in this effect of the one-offs on subsequent dissolutions for those that had more than one partner, just so that only had one? 
like those are already getting concurrency. Sorry, could you say that again? <laughs> this, this last effect uh -huh. of the one offs increasing uh -huh. and the hazard of dissolution. Mm -hmm. Is there a different set of those that have oh, only, they were just in one monogamous relationship versus having more partners? Um no, because of the way we formulated it. Oh, that's a good question. But um, because of the way we did this, um, where th this is basically based on this estimate. So this is the hazard of dissolution, and we kind of grouped all the solutions together. Um, but that would be interesting. I, it would be. I think if I could add one more parameter to this, that would be the interesting one. I think um, trying to separate out some of the dissolution. Okay, and so this is just a real um, little kind of demo. But as I was talking about before, one of the utilities of having the estimates that we've just presented um, is that they can very easily be used to simulate trajectories. Um, going forward to create simulated data, to create kind of a system for simulating um, and seeing how if you increased or decreased concurrency or if you changed other any other explanatory variables that you included in your model, how that would ultimately impact um, kind of at a population level. Um, so um, this is just kind of a sample and these are simulated trajectories for someone who's HIV positive and the bottom row I believe is people who are HIV negative. You can see there's kind of um, a little less activity when we tend to simulate for the HIV negative relative to the HIV positive in the full set. Um, this is just kind of a demo. Okay, so in summary, um, we um, kind of accomplished most of the goals we set out to. We um, we built a model that allowed for that dependence among partnerships um, engaged in by the same individual at the same or different points in time. Um, we explicitly modeled rates of partnership formation and dissolution. And then we constructed a model that's flexible enough to um, include explanatory variables and to account for the potential impact of one-offs. Um, I think um, the demonstration using this data was really interesting, I think, because, um, you know, relative to other kind of studies that I've seen, a lot of which took place in different, different communities, different geographical locations that have been interested in looking at um, measuring concurrency, I think we had some real distinct challenges with this data set, given um, that the one-offs and the kind of a lot of partnership formation and dissolution. Um, okay. Um, so some limitations, some of which I've already noted, but the sample reflects um, specifically individuals who came. It's not. It's not. Um, can't really be generalized to any broad population of MSM or even MSM in LA because it's individuals who came in seeking testing. So their um, sexual partnership patterns. The data that we're actually analyzing might be um, really largely kind of associated with the fact that they felt like they needed to come in and get tested. So, um, that's one thing. Um, again, they could only report on a maximum of six partnerships, and then there were um, there was not there were only approximate dates of first and last um, um, partnership start and end dates, which, as I mentioned, contributed some to the issue of um, you know. Of, did a partnership end before another one began? So that kind of affects, if you think about it, our multi-state trajectory, where we're going from one to zero to one, or where we're going from one to two back to one. Um, and then another important thing that limitation due to the state issue is that we assumed anyone who reported start and end date on the same day to be a one-off, but um, which maybe is reasonable if you said that your relationship started five days ago and ended five days ago, but if you said it started two months ago and ended two months ago, um, we're still assuming that's a one-off, which, um, you know, we're, there's just kind of a lack of information there, like a lot of uncertainty there. So perhaps some, like a model in which you um, kind of could in some, how, in some way incorporate your uncertainty about that would be 
useful, but that can be kind of challenging to do when while still maintaining that framework of being able to model them distinctly from one office to the account on the partnership. So um, another thing to note is that whereas while in theory concurrency increases um, transmission of HIV within a population, for an actual individual holding other, all other things constant, concurrency doesn't actually increase your rate of acquiring the disease. And so while we did see that um, within um, some differences according to HIV um, status in terms of the um, uh, concurrent partnership distribution, um, those might be more reflective of um, other factors rather than the actual individual who is engaging in more concurrent behavior. If you're holding all things constant, it's not them they're increasing risk for their they're technically increasing risk of transmitting to their partners. Um, for instance, like if an individual is going to engage in sexual intercourse with you know, two two people, um, the real difference is are they going to engage in sexual intercourse with them in an overlapping way or in a serially monogamous way? Either way, the person <laughs> who's engaging in the sexual intercourse with both of them is engaging with both of them. It's the other people they're putting at high risk. Um, although, you know, even just identifying um, kind of what we saw with the HIV positive um, different distribution is um, maybe suggests also that the people who are engaging in concurrent sexual behavior are doing so with other people who are engaging in concurrent behavior as well, or you know, there's a lot of other things you could think about, but just something to keep in mind. Um, and then, as we also talked about, um, we chose a very specific set of parametric assumptions with the Poisson process, the Markov, um, and then with kind of the simplification of the expressions for the hazard rates. Um, those are all flexible, but we kind of chose those, you know, to suit kind of our needs, but that there, um, you know, there could be potentially other models out there. Okay, so just in wrapping up, I wanted to thank um, Dr. Pamina Gorbach, who was really instrumental in um, helping us kind of formulate this question and work with the metronomic data, um, then um, kind of helping us come to the ultimate model that we settled on. And then, of course, Dr. Brooke Meyer, who, um, who what every time it's in me, and it's him and I. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions at all? Yeah, I'll throw out the first yeah. question. So, I'll first say a really nice presentation. I mean, the, the modeling approach seems really well matched to this data. Yeah. Oh. So, I was thinking, um, you know, there's some obvious, really good uses of this. It'd be interesting in a larger sample to develop risk profiles and to know who to target your interventions for. But I'm curious, even in this data, if Pamina's had a chance to look at it and think of intervention implications or anything like that. You know, I'm not sure, truthfully. Um, working with her on a different study, kind of, more recently. Um, so I'm not actually sure, um, but I, I do, I think, you know, I, this research kind of led me in the direction of getting really interested in the challenges of multi-state modeling in general with incomplete data, um, which actually kind of moved me even a little bit away from working on the problem that's specific of modeling sexual partnership patterns, but um, I'm kind of moving back into it today. So I think Especially if there's you know, different samples that it would be interesting to develop kind of a more bigger um, well, Echoing uh, is a terrific presentation, a really interesting. Uh, uh, as well as I know you, I wasn't, I wasn't up on you, so it's great to become more familiar with it. Um, and I, I just, uh, you know, along the way, I asked a couple of. Uh, you know, questions on, on this or that, but I, I just want to uh, uh, emphasize the, the, you know, the idea that simplifying some of the aspects of the process then allows you to answer some really interesting questions. And so, like when I asked about, you know, is there something about uh, the model ops that would lead to dissolution of relations? Well, that was a, kind of an intuition, and then. 
one, 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 you know, even though there wasn't a evident relationship with HIV status, there was, I mean, that was sort of there, I think that the, the method in some ways has a certain amount of face validity because it agrees with intuition that a lot of us would have that the one-offs would be damaging to relationships. And uh, um, I just, I had a thought that is sort of uh, maybe elaborating yet further is, um, you know, in, in uh, asking questions about a sensitive area, there are sensitive areas there, so there are just randomized response techniques. And it occurs to me that here, like if you ask people, you know, would you cheat on your partner? People would, most people would say no. But if you ask people, you know, some question about, um, uh, you know, if you had, if you found twenty dollars on the ground, would you ask, you know, people in the vicinity, or would you just keep, you know, there might be questions like that. That if you could find something that's associated with one-offs, then there might be a whole series of questions that you could get that would be like proxies for, uh, you know, uh, you know, like you could sort of in a backdoor way try to understand. Right risky behavior by asking people questions that they don't think of as being particularly sensitive for their, you right. know, that, it might, that you might find being associated with one or something. Yeah. If we modify the dollar question and say, if you found yourself in a room alone, no one else was looking at you. Yeah, those, those, kinds of, those kinds of questions, you know, that, that uh, there might, and I don't know exactly, right. but you could, but, um, you wouldn't necessarily think of those kinds of questions as being HIV research questions, but if you if they were, mm -hmm. if you could, in the context of a model like this, you collect data, you find a lot of one-offs, and then you also, if there's something that does tend to be associated with it, tends to be predictive of the one-off process, then maybe that would be something that would be a proxy for risky behaviors or something. Yeah, that's interesting, because I think, um, I think it's a really valuable data set because I think um, my understanding is that at least I'm not going to go more but is that um, participants that have been recruited through this center and um, MLA in general in the MFM community are really um, I think even compared to some of their peers across the country and across the globe willing to be honest and interested in engaging in research and interested in supporting kind of any effort that's going to go towards, um, you know, like keeping research going. And so I think, you know, I think we're getting a lot of pretty honest data compared to if you took this um, the same calendar method and tried to ask people about their relationship, maybe in some other setting. But the fact that we kind of can tell from this data that, you know, what the predictors are and can make a realistic model using data that is and that's just a hunch. I don't have any reason to necessarily assume that this data is better than other data. But in Los Angeles, they call them professional study participants. <laughs> so, do you have any opportunities for bringing biodata into this? Ooh. So, like, if you were to bring in some markers for viral load or propensity for staying at a suppressed viral point. I mean, one of the things, you know, we were talking yesterday about heterosexual relationships, particularly black women, and the, the riskiest black woman is somebody who has one partner, right? Because she doesn't know what's happening with her partner. And so that's how she becomes infected, which is in contrast to MSM, where there are, you know, opportunities for infection that happen around multiple concurrent partnerships. Um, so, you know, there's... How do you kind of, you know, is there some opportunity for bringing in a biomarker in here that might highlight whether one-offs actually change your risk for transmission? Um, because these are positive guys, so, so that could be interesting. And then the other part would be like, you know, on the other side, looking at the, the risk for, you know, looking at a transmission, you know, a transmissional probability or some kind of marker, you know, even, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I do. I, get your, I think you're right. Um, that almost seems like a logical next step because we're looking at behaviors leading to, it's among 
you know, just looking back, and maybe these individuals were HIV positive or not during the time, you know, in which they were oh, engaging in right? behaviors. Yeah. It's before they knew. Um, but I think we're not in any way introducing into this model um, uh, like a, a HIV component. That would be something I think that even even these estimates um, going forward, kind of using this to kind of build a map of sexual behavior and to see kind of what the viability of a virus introduced into this kind of um, framework, kind of what course that would take. And um, I, I can hear myself thinking about this question completely through, but what you get out of your model is like mean sojourn time mm -hmm. in um, states that are characterized by number of concurrent partners, which is different than uh, duration of partnerships. Right. And yeah. so, like when they go, um, if you're in uh, a state with two concurrent partners and you go down and you lose one, your model's not tracking which one. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, and I'm just wondering whether, does that, what implications does that have for transmission risk or, or you know, or using this yeah. approach for transmission risk or anything else? Like yeah. Or so, I don't know. I, yeah. It's no, I think it's very important. Yeah. I think that's one of the things I would like to be able to say, but you're absolutely right. The way it is now, it doesn't, once you're kind of up in the area of concurrent partnerships, it doesn't, it um, cannot necessarily piece together how long an individual partnership goes on. You're fluctuating between, for instance, two and one. Yeah. Um, so on the other hand, the data has increased that all of that. Yeah. So it just seems like maybe there's something that, you know, some modification of this model that could use that yeah. information. Yeah. Um, I think perhaps yeah. I wonder yeah. I've, kind of, I've thought about it and toyed around with it a little bit. Um, and I think when I was toying around with it, I was toying around with trying to incorporate something into our laboratory <laughs> covariate that um, kind of indicate, I don't know, I'm not sure, um, something about which part, like some way of tracking over time kind of the partnership of partnerships that are ongoing or length of the longest partnership or something. But I, yeah, I, I, this is definitely a, which is, you're right, because it is in the data. Um, I was wondering if you could remind us of the covariates again. I'm thinking about other oh. things like conscious patterns of difference between partners or yeah. there's a way in, in accounting for the loss if there was more than one partner in that one off, like a group sex situation. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so the, so the explanatory variable x can be anything, it's just only um, time varying um, based on when an event is occurring. So um, it's only updated at, um, so basically, um, so this alpha t, t is rounded to the time of the last, um, right now, like last transition, be it, um, and be it the occurrence of a one-off or uh, formation or dissolution, kind of the points at which the model changes. Um, and so, yes, like you could potentially incorporate information about like a given 
um, encounter, kind of almost similarly to the way that we are counting one-offs. You can similarly count like those behaviors. Um, yeah, and then the we um, didn't, we kind of looked at a simpler set of explanatory variables like, like age. That is a good idea. Well, let's give our speaker a hand. She'll be available.